Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Pastor Ed Treat. I'm uh, the founding director of the Center of Addiction and Faith, and our, our mission is to try to raise awareness around the issue of addiction in all of its manifestations. This is our first webinar, um, and so I'm excited to welcome you to a very first for us. Um, and our topic today is, um, is um, pastoral care addiction in an age of pandemic. With all that's going on in the world today, we feel like uh, it would be helpful if we could provide some expertise to those who are pastoral caregivers to be able to understand how this pandemic is impacting uh, issues of addiction and, and uh, members of our congregation and how we can recognize that and respond to it. In recovery, we always say uh, first things first, and so uh, we are very, very fortunate to have with us here today our Bishop Ann Svenningson from the Minneapolis Area Synod, who has agreed to start us off with a prayer today. Bishop Ann, thank you so much for being here. Oh, I am grateful to be here. When uh, Ed first invited me to do this, I thought right away of how um, the 12 steps of AA and Al-Anon have been an incredible source of pastoral care and spiritual wisdom for me in this time of pandemic. Um, I first was with a 12-step group when our son was born with Down syndrome, and I was trying to imagine what the future held. And it, tell, it gave me that incredible wisdom of taking each day at a time, thinking about what I couldn't control and maybe what I could. Um, and I think about pandemics as providing exactly that same context each day, each day. So I am so grateful for the wisdom of the recovering community for the 12 steps. And so one thing I would encourage is for us to have conversations with people who are steeped in that wisdom as we try to lead and provide pastoral care. Um, and as we try ourselves to be um, uh, walking with God in this time with their so much uncertainty. So let us pray together. Oh, good and gracious God, you have called each of us. You have created us in your image. And you have blessed us with life and love and so many gifts. Be with us now in this conversation. Provide what we need for our own personal journeys and also for our callings to serve and provide pastoral care. We praise you for the speakers and all who will uh, present today and ask your spirit to be with them and all of us. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Wow, that was fantastic. Better than I could have hoped for. Thank you, Bishop Ann. And thank you for your amazing leadership um, as our bishop. You just do an extraordinary job. We're so grateful for you. you. Um, we are going to uh, hear from two leading voices on uh, addiction today, and we're really fortunate to have them here. I'm going to introduce them in just a moment. They're going to each share for about 15 minutes each, and then we'll have some time at the end for question and answer. And you'll have to do your Q&A. We did have 100 people register for this, so we expect you know, more to show up through the hour. And so in order to manage the Q&A for that, uh, we'll have to do the Q&A in writing. Uh, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen later on. We'll use that to ask questions during the Q&A period. Uh, in the meantime, we'd like to do a little informal um, uh, uh, survey. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat button. We'd like you to uh, click on that. Tell us where in the country you are from and yes or no, are you clergy? Um, we'd love to see kind of where people are coming from today and, and we'll give a report on that later in the, in the webinar. So here we are. We're in the midst of an incredible pandemic. Um, we are in the midst of a financial uh, <laughs> Catastrophe that's still unfolding, uh, and then we have just an, uh, uh, an eruption of racial issues that are facing our country. So lots of really powerful, different, uh, nothing like this I've ever experienced in my life. Before all this happened, we had a huge um, addiction problem in this country. Uh, it was it was considered the number one health uh, crisis facing the country. That hasn't gone away. Um, that's still there, and in fact, because of this pandemic and all these other things that are happening in our world right now, addiction issues are getting worse. Uh, all the measures of, of uh, strife and indicators of despair are growing. Depression, uh, um, suicide, domestic abuse, and uh, overdoses are spiking tremendously right now. And so as pastoral caregivers, I think we need to uh, understand addiction and um, 
respond to it appropriately. And I think the more we know about it, the better we can respond. I'm privileged uh, today to introduce our speakers. Uh, we have two uh, distinguished guests here today, uh, authorities on the topic. Sonia Waters is an author. I'm gonna just put up her, um, bear with me, I'm still learning. Did I get that to work? Is that, a, can you see it okay? Mm -hmm. Sonia, uh, Professor Sonia Waters is author and pastor. Uh, she's author of Addiction and Pastoral Care. She's an Episcopal priest and uh, professor of pastoral theology at Princeton Theological Seminary. She teaches and writes about addiction, attachment and family systems theory, relational perspectives on the self and feminist and womanist pastoral theologies. Uh, Pastor Waters, we're grateful to have you here. And also with us today is um, Timothy McMahon King. He's the author of Addiction Nation. Tim writes about the ways addiction robs us of freedom. He offers approaches that the church, families and governments can use to better tackle the challenge of addiction and to support those struggling with this disease. Today, we're gonna to begin with you, Tim. I'll let you get started. Thanks so much, Ed. Um, and thanks for hosting this and all the work that you do through the uh, Center for Addiction and Faith. And it was, got the chance to be at your conference last year. Um, and anyone who's thinking about additional ways that they wanna further their education, be coming up again in 2021 and wanted to share with you all a little bit of my story and also try to set up for all of you some of the context of understanding addiction and why what's happening in the world today with the pandemic is making the addiction issue uh, much more severe and something that we're going to see as a challenge for years to come. One of the Ironic things for me is I had spent a lot of time looking at the Spanish flu of 1918 because one of the comparisons is in the last few years, we had for the first time seen the um, drop in average lifespan in the United States. And the last time that had happened was the Spanish flu back in 1918 as a result of the Spanish flu. When we saw this drop in average lifespan these past few years, it was driven predominantly by deaths of despair. So mm. that was overdoses, but also loss of years of life from heavy binge drinking and alcoholism and an increasing suicide rate. And when I started writing my book, one of the things that the subtitle there is what the opioid crisis reveals about us. A lot of the work and the literature out there has focused primarily, uh, has focused a lot on the individuals. Um, how does addiction change the brain? What happens and what are effective ways to treat addiction? I wanted to ask the question of, what does it say about our country? What does it say about our society, our economics, our church, that we have seen such a proliferation of not just addiction, but a deadly addiction, addiction that is affecting the entire average lifespan of our of the US population because of its severity. And we already see 30 states have reported a rise in overdoses um, since the beginning of this pandemic. And so I want to briefly tell a little bit of my story and try to hit on a few points of some of the forces that are driving this. It won't be comprehensive, but hopefully it's a glimpse into some of what we're seeing today. So for me, it was about 10 years ago, I went into the hospital for what was supposed to be a routine procedure um, and it went wrong. It was a scope that was going down and they were trying to look at my pancreas and instead of just looking at it, the doctors actually hit it. And that caused acute necrotizing pancreatitis. I went into acute respiratory distress. My organs were shutting down. I was in the ICU and the doctors told my family to come down and visit because this might be the last chance for them to say goodbye. Now, I pulled through, but at the same time, after a few months in the hospital, I was on levels of opioid pain medications that were normally reserved for people at the very end of life. Good. And it was medically appropriate at the time. The doctors actually didn't, they didn't do anything wrong by prescribing me those medications. I needed them. But it was really clear what was happening while I was in the hospital and the challenges, medical challenges I was facing. What wasn't as clear and what was harder to navigate 
was that during that time, I was also developing an opioid addiction. And unlike a lot of other stories, mine actually did not spiral down out of control. It did not end with a devastating effect in my life. And I owe that in part because I had a doctor who understood what addiction was. And so many people, even though they're in the medical profession, have older ideas of addiction and what it looks like and how to approach it. And so I sat down one day with my, with my doctor. We were doing a routine checkup at the time. I still wasn't able to eat. I would hook up to an IV bag for 12 hours a day. And he was looking at my prescriptions and he noticed they were running out faster and faster. I was taking off script. I was taking more than, than was um, prescribed. But for me at that point, I didn't think of it as a problem. I thought of it simply as me continuing to treat the pain that I was experiencing. And I'd had multiple doctors accuse me of abu abusing my pain medicine um, while I was in the hospital. And so I was defensive. And so he sat me down and he said, Tim, you need to know you're addicted to your pain medicine. And I was ready to fight him. I was ready to give him all the excuses about why I wasn't abusing my pain medicine, why I still needed it. But then the next thing he said was, but you didn't do anything wrong. And that allowed me to breathe out. It allowed me to hear him because I had in my head the old moral model of addiction. That if someone was saying, Tim, I think you're addicted, what I really was hearing was, Tim, you're a bad person. You are a moral failure. There is something wrong with you that isn't wrong with all these other people who are doing just fine. But when he said, Tim, you didn't do anything wrong, it helped me shift my understanding of addiction and my understanding of what I was experiencing at the time. And so often, I think with addiction, we start with that place of the question Jesus was asked when he saw a blind man, who sinned? Was it this, this person or was it his parents? And this doctor helped flip that on its head. And instead of saying, asking who sinned, what did you do wrong? It was a broader question about what is it going to take to heal? And switching from that previous moral model of you are, the only way you get addicted is if you fail and is if you're a failure, if you're a moral degenerate, to understanding that in fact, most people end up having some sort of good that they are trying to attain through their addiction. And so the second thing he said to me is, Tim, I believe you're still in pain. Mm -hmm. And that was so important for me to hear because while my addiction started in the hospital, it started with a medical issue. So many addictions that I hear about um, start in some kind of pain. And there are a few different kinds of pain that I think our country is experiencing right now that had already been bad and are getting worse. And the first is isolation. For me, as I was coming out of the hospital, that also meant that I wasn't going to work. I wasn't seeing my friends. I refused at the time to move back to my family home in New Hampshire. I was living in Washington, DC, because I wanted to tough it out. But that meant I was alone most of the time. And one of the things that's unique specifically about opioid addiction is we know um, endorphins. They're these molecules of emotion and they make us feel bonded to one another. And the word endorphin is actually the combination of the two words endogenous and morphine. Oh. Because the researcher who discovered endorphins was shocked at the chemical similarity between an endorphin and an opioid. So we can think of endorphins almost as the body's naturally occurring opioids. So as we have people who are isolated, as we have people who aren't connected to others, they aren't a part of those communities that they've normally been a part, we see that as a trend in the country as a whole and we see it exacerbated right now, it is little surprise that people are turning to a chemical that for temporarily gives them that same experience of love and connection that they experience naturally through interacting with other people and feeling that love from others. And so instead of thinking of addiction as this relentless pursuit of physical pleasure, we can reimagine it to understand that people are trying to fill something in their life. It could be physical pain, or it could be isolation, or it could be another big thing is social dislocation. Oh. One of the things that we now understand about addiction, my heritage, my ethnic background is Irish. And looking back into the history, there's this great researcher, Bruce Alexander, 
who went back and he looked. The Irish, you know, there's a stereotype about them being heavy drinkers. And from my family history, that stereotype plays out. But that wasn't what the Irish were known for when alcohol was introduced. That kind of stereotype started when there were a lot of Irish people who were moved off their traditional lands and into cities to work in factories. So they were removed from their old context, removed from their old traditions, and now they're kind of these cogs in these factory work. And that was when population-wide averages of alcoholism began to spike. And we see that as the same thing in a lot of different native populations. Those native populations, the spike in addiction didn't start with the introduction of alcohol. It was the introduction of alcohol plus being moved off of lands, plus being told you can't speak your language, plus being told you can't participate in your old, old religious traditions. And that's where it connects. For me, I had previously always thought of addiction as connected to something like gluttony, that it was just wanting more and more and more. And I think the best kind of religious term that we actually have is a term called acedia. Sometimes it's translated as sloth, but it's really understood better as a little bit more of a lack of hope, a sense of despair at the world. And when we think of addiction and what's happening today, as we see people losing their jobs and no longer feeling agency, no longer feeling like they're in control of their life, people who are at despair about what's happening in the country, all of these things can contribute to a society that has a fertile ground for addiction. And the final thing that my doctor said that day that I, I was not expecting, um, especially because he was a pancreatic specialist, is he asked me, Tim, what does a full life look like for you? And he started to ask me about my job, my career aspirations, my family, my friends, and what he understood that I didn't realize until later and saw the research is that the kind of sustained change that living in recovery is, that ending, that, that moving past that addiction is, is not so much a no from an outside force to a particular behavior or to a particular substance. It ends up being a yes to a life that is full, to a life that is good, to a life that has meaning and purpose. And one of the things that I hope we see, and we're seeing this right now, a lot of calls for criminal justice reform, for rethinking what role do we want police to play in our society? Do we really want police to have to be the first responders for every addiction or mental health issue? Mm -hmm. Police officers I've talked to have actually said, I'd love to not have to be the first responder for every mental health or addiction issue that comes, comes our way in our town. These calls are helping us rethink we've been focusing on addiction and drugs in the wrong way for too long. One of the things that I believe as a Christian is one of the greatest transformative forces in my life was grace that I was given, not punishment. And that what I see in the cross is the ultimate outpouring of that grace. And that we are not in a universe that is defined with force and violence being the most powerful ways to create a full society and flourishing people. And this has been borne out in study after study. There was one study in Baltimore of IV drug users, thousands of them participated. They were tracked over the course of 10 years. And the most significant deciding factor on whether or not someone was continuing in their addiction was not the treatment they received, but whether or not they had gone to prison. And if you went to prison, you were significantly more likely to continue using than if you had gotten into an alternative treatment plan and stayed out of prison. And so as we're looking at what's happening today with people not being able to see each other, people feeling isolated, a whole new sense of stress of a world that is so different than what we knew, we can see that all of these factors, it's not that we have a whole bunch of individuals who have all decided at once to forego any meaningful moral pursuits in their life and commit themselves just to the next high or to the next drink. We're seeing a society that is pressing in on people and we need to cultivate a place where people aren't feeling that kind of pressure, where people feel a deeper sense of connection 
they don't feel the stigma that so often comes with addiction so that we can connect with one another and address this in more powerful ways. So I wanna hand it over now to Sonia who is going to help tee this up with, she's got a lot of experience specifically in working with pastors and training ministers and also some more of the factors that are going to, are going to contribute to addiction in our country today. So Sonia, I will go ahead and pass it over to you. All right, hello everybody. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, I'm hoping uh, that you can hear me. I know that currently Tim is frozen on my screen, but we're going to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. You're gonna get enough of my face for a while, so it's gonna be all right. So, um, so I, I'm, the first thing I wanna say, of course, is thank you to Ed for inviting us and check out Christianity and Faith and, and all that it is doing. And also to, to Tim's final point, check out um, Clergy for a New Drug Policy as well. Um, uh, to the final point about the war on drugs, there's a lot that we can do uh, together uh, for these, uh, these, these big issues. Uh, and, and Tim, as always, is wonderful to hear uh, him and his perspective. He's got just such a great story. Um, and there's, um, but I also want to say to, to all who are participating, um, it, as a pastor, I know how hard it is to think about uh, how am I going to talk to uh, a parishioner, uh, somebody that I care for, somebody I'm worried about, um, how do I have that conversation? And Tim's story was such a great example. Like that's my greatest fear is that to get that, get that resistance response back that he was ready to gear up to his doctor. Um, but I think his example is also so beautiful in the extent um, that uh, if, if we change our, um, our ideas from, uh, from confrontation to um, curiosity, to a holy curiosity about the other, about their life experience and about their pain. And if we, if we come into pastoral care from that perspective, uh, uh, then we have uh, um, a much better opportunity to, to, uh, to speak into a person's pain um, and join with them in the process of recovery. So Tim mentioned some points, um, uh, uh, well, a lot of the points that, that, that are, uh, that, that complicate addictions, right? Socioeconomic oppression, stressors, trauma. Uh, um, uh, childhood trauma is one of the um, uh, uh, leading predictors of early onset use of drugs and alcohol. Uh, um, uh, oppression, uh, and, and now we have more isolation, and now we have um, more stress with both the epidemic and also uh, the racial tensions and the pain in this country. There's a lot going on. And so as we reframe our work as pastoral caregivers, uh, we can move from that sin model, uh, perhaps to focus instead on Jesus' care for the spiritually oppressed, Jesus' care for the sick, that addictions are possessive, that they immerse us in pain, and that um, as people who, who wish to model our care um, on Jesus's care, uh, we, we find him uh, reaching the outcast, reaching the oppressed, and also reaching those who are physically and spiritually ill. Uh, and this is the situation of addiction. So when we think about addiction, we're thinking about our uh, parishioners, it's good to understand that addiction is progressive. There's not like one kind of addiction. Um, we know that addictive behaviors are coping skills, uh, we enter into addictive behaviors not to feel, uh, not to necessarily feel um, high or feel um, uh, 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 pleasure in the kind of the in kind of the uh, the idea of um, of using to excess just to feel um, uh, feel that excessive feeling. Uh, we use to not feel whatever we're feeling now, and that's why addictive behaviors are coping skills. We use them to deal with negative emotions. We use them to deal with stress to deal with social discomfort, to try to fit in. Um, and in a progressive model of addiction, what that means is that it's certainly true that some seem more genetically, genetically susceptible to addictions and, and might move quickly into um, abuse of a substance or, or to excessive use. Uh, but some will progress over a long time of using. Uh, uh, some, will, some will manage and be highly functional um, and still be using. 
Uh, and then some will make sudden step changes at a, at a loss or a trauma or an experience of grief or change in their lives where they've been managing for a while and then suddenly something happens and they start using more. Uh, they, they move up in their addictive behaviors. Others can uh, move back and forth in their problematic um, behaviors uh, throughout their lives um, and be kind of sub, uh, subclinical, um, uh, not quite get an addiction diagnosis. Um, but still be in, in, engaging in behaviors that affect their lives deeply and affect their health as well. So when we think about this progress, then we, you can get an idea about why um, uh, this pandemic is a problem. Uh, it, one, because of the greater stressors that are, that are put upon our lives, the greater anxiety, um, but also because suddenly our schedules have changed. Not only are we isolated, but we have a lot of time on our hands. Or, or potentially worse, we're trying to deal with uh, partners and children and work all in a, in, a, in, a, um, in a small space, and yet without the structure of our habitual lives as they usually flow. So if people are, are fairly functional in their addictions or perhaps have problematic behaviors, but kind of have them under control, that added stress, uh, but also that, um, that change of schedule and, and that, um, that change of predictability, uh, can up behaviors. So I don't know about your neighborhood, but what I hear a lot in my neighborhood are people are just gathering to drink like just about every night um, on, with social distancing gatherings um, on the streets. So it's, it's this idea that um, we just, we're just stressed out and a drink will make us feel better. This is the same for behavioral addictions as well, right? We're stressed out, I'm, I'm going to lose myself uh, looking at pornography. Um, uh, I'm stressed out, I'm going to um, eat in a kind of numbing uh, way in front of the TV, or I'm stressed out, uh, I'm going to gamble or game online um, uh, until for hours and hours to get out of my head. So all of these behaviors are entered into it for coping skills, uh, and stress is a, a major way that we enter into them. Uh, and also um, stress uh, leads to relapse as we're trying to get out of them. Um, as we experience more stress, we don't know what to do, we engage in the behavior again. Um, and, and so this means that as we attempt to care for our people, uh, they could be at um, uh, uh, very different places on this progression. Uh, and it's not, it doesn't have to be the case that we're just waiting for um, them, somebody to hit bottom or somebody to um, need to go into a, a treatment program. But instead, as people who are caring for our, for our people's spiritual health, uh, what we can be looking for um, are, are, are signs that they may be engaging in escapist behaviors uh, a little bit too much. Uh, signs that they may have progressed uh, if they were already a little bit problematic in their drinking or in their substance use, um, or um, at, at the most extreme signs that they are that are really decompensating. They're really having a hard time uh, um, managing their use and their lives together, right? And that can look um, a very different for different people. But in a situation where we have a rise in anxiety and stress and we've lost our daily life structure because of quarantine and we're more isolated it's kind of a perfect storm right so as, as, as you're checking in on your people back to that wonderful example that Tim gave of his doctor as you're checking in on your people it can feel intimidating to to confront it because because we used to these those TV shows where it's like some kind of big intervention right um, I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna say this is what you're doing wrong and then I'm going to read scripture at you it'll all be okay most of us uh, realize that that probably won't be okay um, uh, unless you have somebody uh, it's certainly possible you have somebody ready to hear that you know uh, the Holy Spirit works in, in, in many ways um, but usually, what we can think of instead is that you are taking care of the whole of the person's spiritual life. And what that means is that we might just kind of enter in with some language of noticing. Uh, again, kind of coming alongside a person. Uh, not judging the behavior and making it about the behavior as much as being curious about why it is there. What's going on with you? How are you doing? It seems like you're out on the lawn with the drinks every night. Um, what's going on with you? Are, is it getting hard for you? Uh, what might you need to get by? Uh, we, we might get senses where, let's say, we're doing like board or vestry meetings, whatever your committee meetings are on on 
um, Zoom, and we start noticing that some of our parishioners may perhaps have drunk a little bit too much or a little bit affected in some way before they come on the Zoom, right? Uh, this is an opportunity to uh, not to say you're this, you're that, that, but to notice, to come alongside, to try to open up that conversation. Seems like you're having a hard time. I noticed you seemed a little bit out of it on the Zoom. What's going on with you? Uh, and, and and then see if we can enter into a conversation where we start getting a little bit more information about what's happening in their lives. Uh, it, it's also uh, uh, what, um, uh, what Tim's wonderful doctor also seemed to do. It's this kind of idea of um, uh, returning the problem back to the person, right? So, so what we do is we offer feedback. It seems like um, I, I'm getting worried about your behavior. Um, I love you. I'm a little bit worried about your behavior. What do you think? We then return it back to them. What do you think? Um, so, so that rather than us kind of taking the reins and making an us-them kind of problem, we kind of skirt around that by offering our concerns and then returning the problem back to them. The problem is not mine, right? This person belongs to God. They are completely under the sovereignty of God. Not my problem, but I am... Uh, uh, the, the, the caregiver who, who wants to take care of and know what's going on. So I'm going to offer my concern, but also return responsibility back to the other person. Otherwise, what you'll notice, and this is a motivational interviewing um, uh, um, help, um, helpful fact, is that when you, uh, when you argue with somebody who's ambivalent about something, it just strengthens um, the other side in their head, right? Remember this with your spouses and partners because uh, it works for that as well, right? So if you're going to argue with someone about how they should do something, um, they're most likely going to be starting to think about all the reasons why no indeed they should, and how you don't really understand them, they have it under control, why are you bothering them? So we're attempting to uh, avoid that kind of power struggle um, by coming alongside but, um, and, all, and noticing, and also by offering feedback um, and returning. Uh, the problem to them. So they know it is indeed theirs to figure out. Uh, indeed, it is theirs to figure out whether or not they have a problem. Uh, you are there to, to love them to, and to notice what you notice and give the feedback that you give. Uh, and so these are some ways that we can start to be curious about not just the behaviors, but the pain under the behaviors. What's going on with you? Um, well, why is it so hard? Uh, how can I help? How can our community help? How can we come along? How can we all come alongside you in this situation? And so, uh, and so we're a little bit um, uh, more gentle, uh, and yet we don't avoid. We don't avoid uh, because this person belongs to my care, and so I'm going to ask them how they're doing. Uh, the the other way that we can sort of enter into these conversations is notices noticing some change. Uh, we might um, suspect, we might not have seen somebody on Zoom um, um, sneaking the beverage um, on the side, but we might suspect that they're more erratic, more secretive, have a shorter, shorter attention span, have a shorter temper. Uh, we might notice physically that they, that they look uh, uh, pale or more clammy, more sick. Um, they might share with us, oh, Pastor, I'm, I'm just so stressed out, I can't sleep. Uh, issues of sleeping, issues of eating, or waking up at 3 a.m. and the mind going and they can't control it. Um, one thing about addictive behaviors uh, that it's good to let people know, um, you can say you learned this at a great webinar, um, that it's good to let people know uh, that we enter into these behaviors to manage stress, uh, but quite quickly over time, uh, they actually dysregulate our stress. And this is what is particularly demonic in my mind about these behaviors, is that they tell us, you're in pain. I can relieve your pain. It's just for a little while. It's all right. But in the end, they actually cause more pain by dysregulating our stress system. They do this in, in, in a lot of ways, uh, for which I do not have time to explain um, completely. But um, what you can imagine is as they change their brain, uh, as they change the person's brain, as, as one suffers from craving and withdrawal, as one suffers uh, the recovery of a hangover um, and, then, and then returning to intoxication, as one suffers more and more uh, pileups of uh, personal problems and distance from a spouse, a distance from uh, problems with children, our stress gets dysregulated. So you'll find people who are not sleeping well, 
Uh, you'll find people who are, who are misunderstanding, so complaining about these problems that they're having with their spouse or partner, and you're like, hmm, sounds like something's going on there. Uh, so always sort of have in your mind that, um, that stress, um, uh, that a pile up of problems, erratic behavior, secrecy, all might signal something else. And we might want to be curious about that. Have you been drinking a lot? Um, is there something that you're, that, that you're doing to, to, to manage your stress? What do you do in a day? Um, uh, how, are you, how are you coping? Uh, and, and, and maybe ask some questions about their behaviors. Um, because it might be that we learn um, uh, from the behavior because, it, because their behaviors are changing, right? Uh, so in, in all of this, just, just to finish up, uh, because I'm going to be so good about my time, uh, just, to, uh, just to finish up, um, what I want to, uh, what, what is most important as pastors, right? What's most important as pastors is not only that we care, uh, that we have a holy curiosity for the whole experience of another, but that we remember that they are ultimately under the sovereignty of God. Uh, and why this is important is that, uh, as much as we don't want to admit it, uh, when people don't change, we don't like them as much. Um, and when they don't take our good advice, uh, we get a little annoyed at them. Uh, and so in order for us to, uh, to encourage the spiritual discipline of compassion, we have to always remember that we are there as a guide, um, and, and to continually give that person back to God in prayer and so that we can remain open for the time they might get ready to have this conversation with us. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to turn it over because we know we have questions. Um, and, and thank you so much for, uh, for, letting, for letting me share, as they say. Thank you, Sonia. And thank you, Tim. I'm... Um... I, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, how do we applaud for you guys? This, uh, both of you are just outstanding. And uh, I'm, I'm watching the participants. Nobody has left. Everybody's stayed and listened to you. So um, very nice presentations. And I do totally rate to you both and could keep listening to you. Uh, just so folks know that these two will be our keynote speakers at the Addiction Faith Conference in February 2021. And by then, the coronavirus will be all gone and we'll all be back to normal, right? So... We should have no problem. <laughs> well, we'll just see what happens. We may have to move the conference online, but in any case, um, you guys are really good at this and you really know your stuff. So thank you for sharing and, and uh, very well done. Um, we have uh, some time here for questions and answers. We have uh, queued up about four questions. Um, and I'm not sure quite, we, have, we know that this, so we'll figure it out as we go. I'm not sure if you want me to pose the questions or you guys both can see them, correct? Um, can you see the questions? You can click on the Q&A button. For those of you listening, participating, there is a button at the very center bottom of your screen if you're on a desktop or a laptop um, that's Q, it says Q&A. And I'm not sure where that button is on other devices, but I'm sure there's one somewhere. You click on that, you can uh, write a question. Right now we have four questions lined up. Uh, one came in early and I'll read that and I'll just let you two decide which one of you wants to take it and I may chime in too possibly but uh, this question is from an anonymous attendee and he or she states <clears throat> the 12 steps have been successful tool in helping individuals overcome addictive behaviors and are great principles to live by. There are other tools and approaches that utilize science-based and non-spirituality focused tools and approaches but still include the primary benefit of community and fellowship. How have you enhanced your approaches to welcoming, uh, to be welcoming to addicts looking for recovery, community, but non-spiritual tools and approaches? Interesting question. Um, have either of you had any experience with this? Can you speak to it at all? Or? Yeah, I have a few thoughts there. I actually have not been a part of the 12 step tradition that was not a part of my recovery story. Um, the approach, and Sonia mentioned it, uh, that my doctor was trained in, and I didn't even know it at the time, I didn't know what it was called, was motivational interviewing. Um, and that, again, is, as to pull out some of the language Sonia used, is focused on self-directed change and helping another person reflect on what they want in their life, and then being able to identify change words and sustain words and phrases and encouraging those change portions 
while asking insightful questions about the sustain. And it was developed by a doctor, uh, Dr. William Miller, um, fantastic uh, writer, thinker. Um, he is, comes from a spiritual Christian tradition as well, but he did develop, this is an entirely secular focused methodology. Um, and then for me, the next step was actually working with cognitive behavioral therapy and alternative um, pain management. So my, even though I am a spiritual person and I also had disciplines of journal, journaling, writing, meditation, my experience in the recovery community has actually been primarily through those more secular methods. And the thing that I, I'm 12 step tradition is rich and wonderful, but one of the analogies I use is in the cancer research community, they no longer talk about curing cancer. They talk about curing your cancer and developing a therapy for this cancer and this cancer. And they want it to get to a place where their th the therapies and treatments are down to the individual because cancer is happening at a cellular level. And I think unfortunately, too often we have thought of how do we cure addiction as opposed to how do we come alongside someone with this specific story? And that is where, uh, you know, 12 steps has been shown to be like scientifically proven to be highly effective, but not all the time. There are populations where it can actually make things worse. Um, and that's one thing that we need to, I think, get more and more specific in our way of approaching addiction is to see that whole person and, you know, Bill Wilson was a white guy banker who was used to feeling powerful. And so it makes sense that one of the first things that he was learning was how to deal with his feelings of powerlessness. But especially in, like, in working with different populations that have been traditionally oppressed or people who have been abused, um, that might not be the place to start. And there might be more culturally specific, context specific specific things to that person's life journey that might be a better way to address and help them in their addiction than a kind of thinking that AA is supposed to be one size fits all. It's not. Mm. Very nice. Sonia, have anything to add to that? <clears throat> mm, no, absolutely. I, I think I, the, the issue of recovery f uh, for me is an issue of emotional regulation. Some people find emotional regulation tools and coping tools uh, through spiritual avenues. Uh, right now really popular is mindfulness meditation as well which is somewhat which is sometimes seen as spiritual and sometimes just seen as pragmatically um, useful um, uh, uh, yoga as well um, uh, uh, individual uh, counseling and cognitive behavioral kinds of, of of ways of of noticing where your triggers are and how to respond to triggers so there are, so these are all questions we can also talk about um, uh, in, in our congregations or as wherever we, wherever we lead our care. Very nice. You know, I, I was thinking, um, I, and I'm getting way more to, I used to be like a, a one size fits all AA guy, but I'm totally not anymore. I just know that everybody comes from a different perspective and that there are, there are numerous approaches to recovery now. And uh, we'll be featuring many of those on our website and we'll be inviting those to our conferences so that people can know the whole array of possibilities. I think probably what has struck me in more recent years, uh, and Tim, you had a name for it. I can't remember. Was it the happy rat theory? But uh, this whole uh, restoration to, <laughs> did, I, did I get that right? You guys are laughing. So the, rat the, mark, the rat park. Oh, the rat park. Theory. Rat but you know, the, the, uh, you can explain how that worked, but uh, the implications of that are tremendous because it's really, uh, addiction is a disease of isolation and recovery is a return to community. Um, that's so biblically based, uh, Christ based, but but that rat, uh, happy rat theory really kind of uh, undergirds that and says, yeah, you know, recovery is a slow, long, slow process of coming out of isolation um, and returning to community. And so that can take different shapes and forms. But the important thing is that we have a community that holds us accountable and that we're accountable to and that, and that gives us purpose and meaning in life. So I'm going to move on. We've got a few other questions here. Um, there's a question here for, uh, for you, Tim, Mr. King, he calls you. Uh, how and I'm gonna do you have are you able to pull this question up because yeah, we, um, we can all see it okay man. I'm reading it um, I'm not sure I want to read it's it's a somebody with some really big brain power here is asking this question uh, Mr. Mr. King how about framing the Native American historical social dislocation as aided and abetted by white paternalism 
supremacy and racism. How about considering this social violent force creating the constant and continuing social dislocation fueled by addiction experienced with communities of other cultures and communities? Do you want to take that on here? Yeah. Yes, and okay. I think I think it's a very important comment, mm -hmm. and you know, so important just so anyone who's here knows. We just as we were discussing this, we had been thinking about this webinar for a while now and wanted to go ahead with it. But as soon as everything started happening with the um, killing of George Floyd, Ahmoud Aubrey, and <clears throat> uh, Brianna Taylor, we all, the other thing we said is, all right, we need to get one planned specifically addressing race and addiction, um, mm -hmm. because this is a huge factor. Um, the, the violence that was perpetuated against indigenous people, people and anyone, any of non-white groups in America has been huge. And this, from the beginning of American drug policy in the 1880s, it started, the first drug regulation act on a federal level was specifically going after opium smoking. Not morphine, not injecting morphine, opium smoking. And that is because um, there was fears of Chinese immigrants, the railroad was done, that they were taking American jobs and there was fears of them marrying white, being with white women, it was miscegenation. And that was why the, um, the ban was passed on opium smoking, which then led to the Chinese Exclusion Act. And then you see, and in quick history, right, when we say white, we aren't meaning just, we aren't referring to an ethnicity, we are referring to the erasure of ethnicity. Um, Ruby Sales, the old civil rights activist, um, one, one of the people who I quote in my book, she talks about how the problem with whiteness is it's an erasure of culture, right? It's, and it's this belief that you're buying into a power system that is superior and has the ability to oppress others and to judge everything based off of a normative white experience. And so when we look at um, the rise in heroin laws, right? Heroin's diacetyl morphine. It's the, only, it's the schedule one uh, narcotic because it was being used in black communities. And there was an intentional um, decision by Harry Anslinger to target black communities with heroin and to go after um, Latinx communities around marijuana and to spread a whole bunch of lies about its effect on those communities in order to create laws that were designed to oppress. And then we see kind of within the 1980s with the rise of the crack epidemic, right? The peak of cocaine usage in America was in the 1970s when it, white people were using it. And it was not, that's not when we had our freak out and our criminalization. It was in the 1980s when we had crack cocaine going into black communities. And that was where we created the prison industrial complex and created mass incarceration. And the thing with that kind of lie, right? That kind of lie about what addiction is and about the communities that affect it is that it means that we aren't getting to the core of what's happening within addiction, right? So we criminalized addiction in the 1980s and created mass incarceration focused primarily on black men and then thought that we had dealt with drugs and addiction. And when most people kind of peg the end of the crack epidemic is around 1996. It also happens to be the same year that Purdue Pharma came out with Oxycontin. And the worries about people getting addicted to Oxycontin were relatively low because, oh, this is doctors prescribing it primarily to white folks in the suburbs and in rural areas. And I think there was a false cultural narrative that somehow your skin color meant that you were less likely to get addicted. And as a result, we saw then opioid addiction and overdoses then ravaging white communities too. And so that's where I think it's dealing with addiction and race, touching on it a little bit here, it deserves an entire webinar and pulling in other experts. So I hope you all will come back for that one because it will be an important conversation. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, and, and the uh, person who asked that question said thank you and looks forward to the uh, next conference. I think we have time for one more. There's some others here. I guess we'll deal with those following in writing. 
um, unless you have another idea about how to deal with that in terms of our time frame. I don't know if we'll stay over for those who want to stay. But uh, Sonia, there's one uh, I think I'd like you to take, um, if you wouldn't mind. Um, Robert Kuhn says, how, so how able are we to come alongside those in need when we're attempting to be safe in rural areas? Zoom and other techie stuff is not so available. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a great clarifying question, Robert. The, um, when, I, uh, when I mean come alongside, um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking less spatially um, uh, or, or less um, uh, in terms of, 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 of how much we accompany someone. I mean, we're, we're, we're limited by social distance, we're limited by, um, by technology. Uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm more referring to is a technique uh, so that if you're talking to them on the phone, let's say that's your only ability um, uh, currently, if you're talking to them on the phone, um, how, how am I going to bring this up? Am I going to bring this up like this? Or am I going to bring this up like this? Am I going to come alongside someone? So when we're thinking about coming alongside someone, I'm thinking about walking with somebody on their journey, step by step, as opposed to getting in, getting in front of them and saying, where are you going? Um, so that's kind of more the coming alongside that I meant. Um, uh, I think I can, uh, uh, I think I can uh, get if you're, if you or anybody really is feeling helpless about the situation of pastoral care in this time. Uh, that is, that is a whole nother, um, a, a, a really painful thing for us as pastors to not have the kind of bodily connection we have to our people. We do so much pastoral care by how we um, just spend time with them. Right, um, and and that's lost to us, and it's a big grief that we that we have, um, and so in, in however you check up on your people, uh, just thinking about um, dealing with difficult conversations in that technique as opposed to a straight on, was really all I meant. Yeah, yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, we have some other questions here. Uh, too many for the time that we have left. Uh, we do need to wrap up. So, I, Tim, uh, Sonia, if you have any suggestions on how we deal with those final questions, um, I'm open to that. I suppose we could close up the meeting for those who want to go and if those who want to stay and deal with these questions. Uh, I don't know if you have time for that. We didn't discuss how we would handle the extra questions. Um, but um, let me uh, say some things before those who need to go, who've scheduled other things at the uh, top of the hour. I just want to share with you some final uh, announcements. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with you if I can make this work right, um, and share with you some things that are coming up that I'd like you to be aware of. Uh, did I get this to work? There we go. So, um, and some of these are answers to the questions, some of the questions that are remaining. Um, Tim and Sonia, thank you for being here. Once I'm done with this, I'll uh, invite you to share some final thoughts. But I wanted folks to know that we are planning this to be a monthly web webinar. Uh, and so each month we'll have a different topic and some different speakers. Next month, July 23rd, at this time, so it'll always be the fourth Thursday of the month from 1 to 3. Uh, 1 to 3, is that right? No, it's an hour long. Uh, that's that's the wrong time. It's noon to one Eastern time. So forgive the time there. That's a typo. Uh, next July, uh, noon to one Eastern time. But the topic will be how to build an addiction ministry in your church. And uh, we'll be featuring some people who've done that successfully. And they'll be here to talk about the pitfalls, what works, what doesn't. And then the following week, uh, we have a training session for uh, addiction leadership training. And this is being, uh, it's fee-based. You need to register. There's a contact information there. You need to talk to Drew Brooks at Faith Partners. His uh, uh, contact information is at faith-partners.org. But Drew is going to, uh, in, the, the idea is that you come, if you're clergy, if you're non-clergy, you bring your pastor. If you are clergy, you bring a key leader to come to this uh leadership training. So essentially what we're doing is training a leader to be a leader in your congregation on this topic. So you come with your with your parishioner and they will learn how to lead a ministry in your church. And then you get to, as a pastor, step aside and let this leader run with it. And then there's some follow-up training that uh, teaches them how to recruit a team, how to do a congregational assessment to determine your readiness and, and the appropriate ministry that fits your congregation. Um, it's a, about a year-long process. There's some follow-up trainings and coaching sessions and some, some supports along the way. The, um, so 
If you're interested in knowing more about that, contact faithpartners.org. Uh, but the training session will be by webinar next July uh, in the evening on Wednesday evening from 6 to 9 and the following Wednesday from uh, 6 to 9. So a two-part training session. Now, after we're done with this webinar, Tim and Sonia and I are going to be uh, brainstorming about, uh, and, and members of the advisory team for the Center of Addiction and Faith, we're going to invite some uh, people of color from other races to come and help us guide this conversation because we don't want to be uh, more white people trying to figure out uh, the, the solutions to <laughs> uh, other races. Uh, we like their voices in guiding this, but we're going to be putting together a special edition between now and the next webinar, hopefully soon, on how drug policy and addiction enter into the issue of race and social justice. So we hope to have a, a lively discussion about that. We feel like it's very timely and urgent. So we're, we're excited to put that together. So just watch for that. We'll be emailing. If you're on this uh, webinar, you'll get an email about it. So just watch for that. Hopefully you'll be able to make it. Once again, the Addiction of Faith Conference is February 11th, 12th, and 13th in Bloomington. Hopefully we'll be able to have that there at that time. We'll wait and see. We'll just uh, watch and see how things develop. Now, the Center of Addiction and Faith has, uh, is a new ministry that's being developed. Um, it will be a resource center for all the things we're going to be talking about at these webinars. These webinars will be available there. We hope to put together some podcasts and devotionals. Everything about addiction and faith will be uh, provided here. It's in early stages of development, and we're close to launching our new website. Um, it's not up yet, but you can learn more about um, my role in that and my dream and vision for that uh, in my personal website. I talk about it a great deal. Um, pastoredtreat.com. You can go there and kind of get a sense for what I'm hoping to accomplish, the vision that God has given me around this topic. And uh, I have quit half my job as a pastor to do this work, um, and so I'm trying to build this ministry. I think it's important, and uh, but I can sure use your help and your partnership if you want to come alongside me and help with this. You can <laughs> you can go to our current Addiction of Faith Conference website and, and donate and help with your finances. We'd also take some volunteers, too, if you're interested, there's a way to do that. Um, so that's it for announcements. Tim and Sonia, do you have any final thoughts before we let folks get back to their, to their um, busy lives? Yes, Sonia, do you want to go first? Oh, no, you, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can. Um, I mean, I think, I think just in summary, when we're thinking about addictions, addiction is a symptom, right? Not the, addiction is a problem, but it's a symptom. Addiction is a cry. It's, it's a cry about personal suffering. It's a cry about social suffering. It is a, a, a cry about socioeconomic suffering. Um, and it, it becomes in, it, incumbent upon us as Christians to listen to the cries of our people. Uh, and to understand them to indeed be cries. Uh, mm -hmm. how, we, how we manage those cries is with, is with compassion and love. How we manage those cries is, 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 is crucial to our theology of addiction. So go ahead, Tim. I'd love to share one study that really shifted my view. It was two researchers, Leek and King, they went to three different alcohol recovery centers and they studied everyone that was being treated there in their history and their background and they, after an ex exhaustive look at the people being treated, they produced a list for the counselors and the staff at these, reco at these recovery centers and said, these are the people that we believe are most likely to get sober and stay sober. And so uh, they would check in from time to time. And sure enough, each time they checked in, they were spot on. Each person on their list was more likely to get sober and stay sober, more likely to get a job and keep that job. And if they relapsed, it was shorter and less severe. So everyone wanted to know, what had they figured out about these individuals that was such a powerful predictor of who would enter into recovery? And so the big reveal was nothing. They had randomly assigned every person on that list. So the only thing that changed was the expectations of the staff and the counselors. And so one of the challenges, I think, for anyone in ministry or a lay leader or stepping alongside someone who's struggling with addiction is that that hope, that kind of prophetic imagination of being able to see a different world before it's even there is not pie in the sky thinking. It is a kind of faith and it's a hope and it's a love 
that literally changes the reality of the world we are living in. And I think that each of us, no matter what faith tradition we might be coming from, has that opportunity to participate in that kind of radical reimagining, reimagining of what addiction looks like in our society and how we can stop thinking about the stigma that has so often come with addiction and begin to think about those who have had this struggle as people who are going to be prophets for us all, who have seen something that's wrong with our society today, they have felt it in their own lives, and they are then using those lessons to transform themselves and their communities and the world around them. Beautiful. Thank you, Chan. Thank you, Sonia. And thank you to all who have participated here today and, and are here. In lieu of applause for our guests and our speakers today, you can go to your chat page and, and leave a comment, a compliment if you want. Uh, we're grateful you're here. We hope you keep coming back and uh, go in peace, serve the Lord. Tim, Sonia, 